have uh, northeast in, in crisis, and you have south south in crisis, not uh, out of, uh, crisis because of mismanagement by the leadership in that area. And somewhere to the bottom uh, right is the southeast. Yes. And how would we classify them? Somewhere in limbo, in the middle, between the uh, flashpoints and the blue ocean. The southeast, post-war southeast, um, if you look at the GT Bank investment, they have 5% of the entire network there, as against 52% in the southwest, and as against 20, 32%, uh, no, 10% in the south-south. So the southeast is landlocked. It's high concentration of trade, which actually means there should be greater activity there. But it is wholesale and retail trade and other activities. Um, it's much better than what it was, but it's far, far, far below. But if you take the population count in that area and the demography, they definitely need more resources there. But they do not generate, they don't have the mineral resources and all that. So all they have to do, the Southeast thrives on domestic diaspora. That is the people from the Southeast are living all over Nigeria and sending back money uh, to their own neighborhood. Uh, if, we t if, we, if we go back to that map uh, very quickly, folks in the uh, my produ our production team, if you put that map back, you find out that uh, Abuja and Lagos, where you have the affluent and high the affl affluence, the dollar earning Nigerians, the yes. diplomats, the high rise, what you can call our own skyscrapers, yeah. uh, you hardly have them exist in the southeast, if any. No, but if you look at those elites in, in Lagos and in Abuja, they are southeast indigents who live there, what, what I call the diaspora, and send money back home. So home is just a source of remittances back from the diaspora. Well, not only that, the diaspora, the Nigerian diaspora also have a good chunk of Southeasterners. So the geography is not economically attractive, but the people have a lot of resource in them with their, with their using. The Southwest have resources, they have people, they have diaspora and they have invested in the past. And it takes you to the next map, which is investment in education. Uh, when you look at the education map, my uh, child. This is a nation divided by education. Yes. You think yes. education is part of a, so much inequality that goes down to there's our economy evidence, and There's evidence to show, empirical and an anecdotal evidence, to show that the more you invest in education, the more you reap. So the, the time lag between when you invest in education and when you get the rewards is. Pro about 10 years, maybe one generation. So what has happened is that if you look at the, the map, the southwest and part of the south-south, they've invested significantly in education and they're reaping that benefit. But even then, they're still average. Nigeria's educational investment is still suboptimal, right? So, but even in the suboptimality, in the country of the blind, there are all, these are one-eyed guys on the, on the south-south, south-south and south-west. But if you go into the northeast, then this is there's a, so there's an education problem, there's an investment problem, there's a distribution and investment opportunity problem, and this is a potent. You know, it it has the makings of what can erupt into anarchy if 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 it's not well managed. That's why they call for inclusive growth. We must now begin to invest, not just invest in growth, but invest in those things which are labor intensive, which will create employment. Uh, our time is running, Mr. Rowani. One quick question. Do you think we should revisit the basis for monthly FAC allocations as a way of spreading this uh, commonwealth around? Part of, part of the restructuring argument, part of the resource control argument is that should we, these federating units that form the federation, should they own their own mineral resources and then contribute to the commonwealth? Or should we have what you have, which is a unitary what you have a federal government de jure, a unitary government de facto, which means that you, have, you still have a military command structure running Nigeria where everything is centered in the middle. Um, if you do that, then you might create <coughs> resources. So resource-rich regions will have more money. The income distribution will be more alarming, and therefore you have to actually manage it, reconcile one, rewarding resources, but also rewarding stability, because stability comes before democracy. And democracy and stability will give you sustainable economic development. In other words, what conversations should we be having right now in summary? Uh, well, first and foremost, you've got to think about 
talking about the political arrangement, but also talking about how to lift the poor. There's poverty, there's abject poverty, and no matter what happens, where I come from, they say the, the rich, the poor cannot sleep because they are hungry, and the rich cannot sleep because the poor are awake. You need to do something about poverty in Nigeria. You haven't addressed the minimum wage yet, you haven't addressed inclusive growth yet fully, and you have to carry everybody along, or else what you have is just a storm waiting, waiting to happen. Uh, this looks very a terrifying conclusion, but... But the economy, wait, be, whatever you say, the economy is growing positively, mm. which is good news, but the distribution and the fact that you have to carry everybody along is important. Distribution, distribution, <coughs> distribution. How do we distribute these on the, the normal budgetary arrangements? Uh, do you think the EIGP is the silver bullet? Um, Part of it, government contribution, government consumption as a percentage of total GDP is still about 8 or 9 percent. Private investment is also much higher and much more efficient. More than anything else, private consumption is there. The informal sector is about 30 percent. If all of these sectors are growing and firing on all cylinders, you will find that you'll be able to do much more. And that these problems that have, we have highlighted this morning, may not be actual problems, that they become opportunities. In one minute, do you think we can't borrow anymore? How do you think we should look as the means of this budgetary financing gap that we have? I don't think the Minister of Finance said we can't borrow anymore. What she's saying is that optimal utilization of resources is better and much more efficient for you to increase your revenue, block your leakages, than just borrowing to, for, to finance consumption. Um, the headlines have misrepresented the fact. The fact is that no country survives without borrowing. We need what we call efficient borrowing from the multilateral, which is concessionary. We use that to substitute domestic debt. Our debt service is 68 percent, 66 to 68 percent of our independent revenue. We need to increase the revenue so that we are actually fiscally prudent and fiscally efficient. That is what the minister said, and I don't think we sh she said we cannot borrow anymore. Okay, Mr. Rwani. Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. We appreciate this conversation, an enlightening and insightful one. And of course, we uh, appreciate everyone who has been part of the conversation on social media, on Twitter. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rwani. Very quick before you go, I say God bless uh, BJ Rwani and the entire FDC team for this uh, research poverty map of Nigeria. We'll be back after the break. Thank you.